Hey guys, it's Dr. Hayes, and this is our video about Sandra Cisneros and the house on Mango Street. Um, this is just a little bit of a video of background about her and her writing style and some of the context around the novel. Um, in your reading responses and in class discussion, we can talk about specific passages from the text and themes in the text, but I did want to give you a little bit of background in this video to go along with our reading of her novel for the week um, and in specifically in context uh, as it's a coming of age novel for our class coming of age novel so um, in addition to this lecture that I'm giving right now I'm gonna have you watch another YouTube video I will put the link in the description of this one and I'll send you guys an email with a link to it as well it's a about a 15 minute summary and analysis with some some major themes and symbols from the the text and a summary of the all the characters and everything so instead of me going through all of that there are already videos that exist about that so i'm gonna i'll link one so your required videos for the week will be this one and that one uh, together and that will be your virtual content for the week um so for this one though i'll just give you brief bio details about uh cisneros as they apply to the topics of our, our class and of this novel and then I want to go into um, the genre that she writes in and that uh, Mango Street falls into and then some of the um, specifically coming-of-age elements that are in the novel and that go along with the context of the novel. Um, so first off about Sandra Cisneros herself um, she is Mexican-American and her like she was born in America but her family uh, her mother was also born in America but is from Mexican descent and her father was born in Mexico and so um, she was she grew up in the Chicago area um, to say she grew up in the Chicago area that's a little bit um, simplified um, her father because of his career he did upholstering um, furniture upholstering and things like that and because of his career and his job ambitions he went back and forth they their family moved quite frequently when uh, sister Rose was a child and they moved to mexico and then back to the the states and mexico and back to the states so back and forth between chicago and mexico and so there was this sort of cyclical migration pattern that her family participated in at growing up up until she was she they it kind of stabilized when they purchased a home of their own when she was 11 I think and so it kind of stabilized a little bit and that is that home that they purchased instead of before that every time they lived in Chicago it was somewhere different little apartments and of various qualities usually all in low-income areas but um, there wasn't really any sort of um, consistency or dependence like anything she could depend on as a as a consistent home um, but then they bought a house and it wasn't on mango street that's a fictional location but um she they did live in a neighborhood that was similarly um could be similarly described um to the neighborhood described in mango street in the novel and um, and so she, because of that, she experienced this sort of multicultural uh, existence growing up that I'll talk more about in a little bit. Um, when she, she was really gifted and bookish. She wrote poetry all through school. In high school, she worked on the literary magazine at her school, edited it, not just worked on it, but edited it, um, wrote poems and won awards for them in school and everything. So she, she wrote and and was interested in poetry and literature from very early on and um, she ended up going to school for um, writing to for literature and creative writing and she went to um, Loyola University for a bachelor's and then she ended up going to um, a specific fine arts program in Iowa University of Iowa for a, a MFA Masters of Fine Arts and so she has um, her education um, bachelor's in her graduate program was in um, creative writing and poetry and and specifically um, creating works of literature and so um, 
because of that, um, she, you know, she was, she didn't always work as a writer early on. Like she's, she's had other jobs. She worked in, she, usually all involved with education. She's been a professor and a teacher. She's been a school counselor. She's been, um, uh, like a, an administrator, a college administrator, uh, admissions, not administrator, admissions type style person. Um, so she's worked in the educational field quite a bit with mentoring students and teaching and and you know of all on all the different sides so she has been very much involved in education in addition to being an author and poet um, as a career as well um, she this is an interesting thing about her as it relates to some of the topics of her writing and some of the things we've talked about in class so far um, she's never married never made a family never had children and that was an intentional choice on her part um, it goes right along with some of the themes and and in Mango Street about um, Esperanza just wanting some space to herself and wanting a home of her own and a place to go and be and and write and not have to um, there's a quote from Mango Street live her life behind a rolling pin right and prop a baby on her hip and that's because that's what hips are for you know there's a part in Mango Street about that and so she um, as in her, in her adult life she moved to San Antonio and she purchased a home in San Antonio and made it sort of this um, retreat for herself and, and a, a, a writing um, refuge after she was able to sort of get on her feet. She, she did um, move out of her family's home um, as a young woman uh, after college, uh, to, not an unmarried woman who didn't live with her family in the Hispanic culture is pretty rare. So. Um, yeah, you know, she talks about it in the introduction. If you read, if you get this, the 25th anniversary edition of the book, this is the one I think I ordered for the class. If you get that, there's a picture of her there in the front. And it is, this is, she said, this is her, me when I was writing House of Mango Street. And she describes her first little apartment that she had all by herself. So if you haven't already, I would definitely recommend reading this introduction part in, in the beginning of uh, the novel because it, it sets up a lot of her headspace and the things she was trying to do with the novel and her headspace when she was writing it. Um, so definitely look at that. But she then eventually settled in, in San Antonio, as I said. And now, I think in present day, she lives in, in Mexico. She's back in Mexico. She lives there and has sort of a similar um, retreat of, <laughs> to herself, but she, she's always been on she likes to be on her own and she sort of likes that independence of being a um, single woman which is pretty admirable I think um, just because that's something even from very early on that's something she said she wanted that's something that she's um, yearned for and sought out and so she's she's living that out as in her adult life um, she was born in 1954 so she's getting she's in her 60s by now um, 70 Let's see my parents are birth. so she's almost 70 uh, she's getting she's in her late 60s um, so um, but uh, you know she's still pretty involved in the in the um, the literary scene and, and culture and still is interviewed and winning awards and things like that um, so let me talk about the genre that she writes in so she writes a genre of literature uh, called I'm, I put it on a board at uh, Chicana is I think how you say that forgive me I don't speak Spanish so I'm pretty sure Chicana is how you say that um, that is the feminine form of Chicano uh, Chicano and Chicana that means Mexican American basically um, the Chicano culture is um, people uh, American citizens people born in America who are of Mexican descent and Chicana is the feminine of that so women a, a Mexican American woman and the reason that that is significant to to make it the feminine the the ah chicana is because Cisneros is, was one of the very first uh, when she when this came out in 1984 and s other of her poems and stories came out in the 80s and 90s uh, Cisneros really paved the way as a as a leader of Chicano writing. There had been Chicano writers, uh, Gary Soto was one I think I remember, and there's I mean there's lots of other male figures who are Mexican-American and who have write and 
and do poetry and and our our voices in that community um, but as far as female writers they were much later to come along and and uh, they're catching up there's a lot more um mainstream published chicana writers but at the time when cisneros were right was writing there really weren't hardly any um probably the most other well-known one you might have heard of is gloria and zaldua she is um she's famous for writing about the borderland of between you know um, the southern part of the united states texas and, and arizona and along in there and how it borders with mexico and like living on this neither nor space right down there this borderland idea and so gloria anzaldu is another very influential chicana writer uh, but cisneros was influential in that area and because so much of her um the way she lives her life what she writes the character she depicts is very much uh, there's a heavy emphasis on the feminine experience in the hispanic culture right and so um that is something you know to pay attention to is is how um her race comes into her experiences of growing up um because we talked about that with i know what the cage bird sings with my angelou with being african-american in the american south in the 1930s and 40s how that her race um, contributed to her uh, c growing up and her coming of age so Cisneros's race is very similar um, a lot of her themes especially early on in Mango Street and some of her poetry she does look a lot um, at adolescence and that transitional period from childhood into adulthood not all of her poetry and, and books are like that um, especially some of her later stuff is a lot more mature um, collections of poetry that have you know just downright erotic some of them uh, but you know so they're a little bit more mature some of her later stuff but her early stuff is definitely uh, focused on coming of age and mango street itself is was a runaway success it's run lots of won lots of awards it's taught in all kinds of school, middle school high school colleges lots of educational institutions use mango street as a representative of um looking at the coming of age process in this minority uh, various minorities uh, chicana uh, female um, lower class right so there's all these different different groups that are, are represented um, by esperanza the main character and her friends and and the people in her neighborhood um those other other things about the genre the style of it you might have noticed is um it's just each little chapter is a short little vignette they're very they're they're short uh, like this like for example here's one that's the whole chapter starts here goes here to here that's about a normal length for each little chapter so they're little snapshots of life in living in the barrio in this neighborhood where mango street is and it's all of the various characters that she interacts with and the neighbors and the experiences that she has and so because of the construction the structure of the novel it seems it, it is very episodic where similar to i know what the cage bird sings where each little chapter can stand on its own and be read as a complete unit of a little experience or a story however it's they're not completely disjointed they are they do follow when you link them all together they do create a narrative progression right where th they move to the neighborhood and then all the different characters and all the different neighbors are introduced and their interactions are established and then you know um esperanza has all of these experiences and, and some of them are pretty harrowing and force her into a level of maturity before she's ready and she kind of learns some things about her state in life and her her place in the world and then there's definitely this this desire where she's trying to get out right she's trying to break free from her the expectations of her life in mango street and she eventually does leave but then just determines to come back and that's how you know the novel ends with her determination to come back and um help anyone in mango street which is a symbolic you know we realize at this point anyone who's stuck in their own mango street she wants to empower them and help them um, so there is a plot progression throughout the various little vignettes, the little scenes that are depicted in each novel, in each um, chapter, rather. Um, 
the t tonally, it is sort of a cross between, um, it's not quite poetry, obviously, it's not poetry, but it's not straightforward prose, which is the opposite of poetry, just like a story. It's not straightforward prose either. It's lyrical, it's poetic prose. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so the way she says things is, you know, there's a musicality to it. Um, you can tell that it's almost like it's intended to be read out loud. There's the dialogue. Sometimes it has a, there's a rhythm to it. There, you know, some of the rhyme schemes, some of the uh, descriptions of the different scenes. There's a little bit of a, it's not straightforward poetry, but it is poetic. Uh, the way it's written. It's it's this poetic um, cadence. Uh, there's a rhythm and a cadence. I don't know how else to describe it. It's it's but it's definitely intentional because Sister Rose is a trained poet. Like she knows the craft of poetry and she um, appreciates the sounds of words and she appreciates the um, the rhythms that they make. So to add to this, uh, it's not you know, not only does she have her poetic training and her just sort of personal appreciation of words, she also, something that's unique about Mango Street and the, and the tone of it is the, um, the bilingualness of the author. So Cisneros's comfort in both Spanish and English contributes to the rhythm and musicality of the, of the prose, of the, of the text. Mango Street is written in English. She filters in a few Spanish words here and there, and then through the context of the sentence, you figure out what the Spanish words mean. But it's primarily written in English. But even still, she has even said in interviews that even though it's written in English, there's definitely elements of the, the syntax, meaning like the, the word order in the sentences. Um, some of the vocabulary she picks, some of the descriptive phrasing, there are definitely things, and and the the gendering of certain objects or people. Um, there's definitely influences from Spanish, from the way Spanish is constructed and the way Spanish um, puts forth its sentences and in the orders that the words are. There is definitely influence from Spanish, even though the book is in English. Um, so you know, it gives. Some people think that the the Spanish grammatical influences give the English a sort of childlike tone a little bit, a little bit of a, an innocent, immature, childlike tone. Um, but that's that's not, you know, the, I don't, she has even said, I, that's not intentional. I was just influenced by my Spanish um, heritage as well. Um, but, you know, the way Esperanza talks sometimes is a little comes across as a little naive and I think that's a, at the beginning that's maybe a little bit on on purpose but but there's just there's something about when a bilingual author writes in one language or the other something from their other language ble is bleeds through it's un unavoidable it unavoidably bleeds through and it adds a texture that you just can't get um, it, you can't fake that it just comes naturally okay so let me talk about now some of the coming of age themes specifically. Um, so something I mentioned earlier I was going to come back to is the whole idea of borderlands. Um, so adolescent literature and studies in general, not just about uh, a certain minority or gender or anything, but adolescent studies in general uh, focus a lot on this transitional period, right? You're in this in-between state. You're not a child anymore, but you're not fully an adult. Um, your body tells you that you're ready to be grown, right? Your hormones kick in. Biological imperatives um, say, procreate, procreate, it's time, it's time, <laughs> right? But socially speaking, you're legally not allowed to at certain times. You know, you're le legally not allowed to do things yet. There's a certain order that you have to um, grow up legally. We have legalized the milestones of growing up, especially in our country. And there's only certain times you can do certain things. And it's considered inappropriate, socially inappropriate to do, to experience certain coming of age milestones before the socially dictated approved time. Um, 
Sister Rose challenges that a little bit, the mainstream idea of the coming-of-age timeline. Um, she seems to depict a Hispanic culture in which some of those uh, milestones are uh, leapfrogged and some come early. There are many characters, uh, I think there's three at least in this novel, um, who, women who marry very young, who could be considered very young, you know, like eighth, ninth grade young, um, or, or very, very early, like don't finish high school and, and get married. Um, so that is a recurring theme of young women who um, are thrust into adulthood before mainstream culture society would say that that's it's time um so that's something that she deals with is this borderland of when is the crossover when's the in when do you when are you out of the in-between how long does the in-between last um so this idea of borderlands as far as adolescence goes is something that definitely takes place in her novels but because of the um chicana aspect of it the that part of the culture there's another that's a borderland too she's in between is she Mexican? Is she American? There's this pull between her two, the two heritages that she belongs to because she was born in America. She, you know, has always lived, you know, grown up in America um, with sort of intermittent back and forth, Esperanza, intermittent back and forth between America and Mexico. But um, she, you know, so she feels like she's both and, and, the feeling there is when you're both, you're neither, right? You're not, you're not fully either one. You're a little bit of each one, but you feel like you have both in between you, you know, it, like in you, right? And so you're like, which one am I? In my children's literature class, uh, we talk about this as well. And I usually cite the um, work by W.B. Du Bois, The Souls of Black Folk, 1903. I think 1906, early 1900s when that came out. And he talks about this idea of um, two-ness, uh, this, this state of being all of, all of both um, African-American and American, like African and American in the same body. Um, all right, two-ness, so you can see what I mean. This act of, of having two-ness. <laughs> Right, it's your both and. Um, so um, this that that idea of of this he calls it double consciousness is what Du Bois calls it. This idea of double consciousness, where you have two cultures living inside you and they're at war with each other. Um, so I definitely think that that applies to Cisneros as well because of. Um, being born in the United States, living in the United States, going to school in the United States, having friends in the United States, but having a heritage and parents who are from a different country, who are from Mexico, and having this um, feeling feeling like you're living on a border. Um, there's also this sort of two worlds border aspect, um, literally, in the neighborhood. You know, there are several times where they leave the neighborhood and it's dangerous and so they come back to where it's safe, right? And the people they encounter outside of their neighborhood, if they venture out, um, are a threat. And so they, they come home. So um, so this idea of, um, it's like her neighborhood is where she belongs, but it's also she's trapped in there as well. She's trapped, she doesn't feel like she can get out. She doesn't feel like she has any opportunity to leave her neighborhood safely um and part of that's because she's a woman part of that's because of her her culture and her brown skin right and so a lot of adolescents feel similarly trapped in their teenageness right their teenage body they don't feel like they can leave it safely they don't they feel they don't feel like there's any way out it feels um, interminable at that time it feels like it's never ending when you're going through it so all of these aspects of this in-between border transitional period age-wise her culture geographically speaking um you know she she feels sort of trapped in this in-between and and that's a lot of what's um going on in this novel and some of other sister nurses other poetry um, so that's a, a theme of coming of age another one is specifically the being a hispanic female a chicana f woman in a, you know, the Hispanic culture is pretty notoriously patriarchal. 
Uh, that's another word for us. <laughs> uh, so you're learning all kind of vocabulary words in this lesson. So um, the term the term patriarchy, right? So it comes from the Latin um, pater, which is uh, father. Um, paternal, right? Paternity test is determining who's the father. So the patriarchy is a system of governance, a system of um, rule where the father is the central authority figure. And uh, throughout history, many, many cultures have been um, organized around a patriarchal structure where a man or specifically a father figure is the head of the head leading governing entity. The United States is, has been that way with, you know, all of our leaders, all of our presidents, everything have been men, right? So um, it's not just a, a, an element of the Hispanic culture, but um, if you read any kind of book from the past, any kind of period piece set in the past, even in, in um, Anglo worlds like, you know, England and the United States and, and places that speak English, if they've they've been notoriously patriarchal in the past where the father's rule goes women had very few rights um didn't own property didn't you know weren't educated at the same level you know we've talked about that we looked at that with little women little women is set in a very much a patriarchal uh, culture where the the father is the head and the man is the head and and alcott was fighting back against that well the hispanic culture a lot of people have exp uh, examined how it has um, been long, it has taken longer for members of the Hispanic um, culture community to challenge the patriarchy, to challenge that system as um, fair or valid or healthy. And so um, in English speaking cultures, we have been challenging, you know, feminism has taken root and we've been challenging the patriarchy right and left but um you know sister rose is depicting a situation in which you know she has these young brides in here who um their husbands are very um domineering maybe a little bit strong but they're not allowed to leave the house and sally's not even allowed to look out the window and and you know it's the guys is that it's their husbands are protecting them right they're protecting their safety because they're so pretty that they are in danger right um but it is a um it is very much a controlling possessive idea too but um so cisneros has talked about and has written about this um the the sort of unspoken understanding in the hispanic community that whatever the father says goes you do not as a as a young person you do not leave your father's house until you get married you do not move on and live on your own until you ha are moving into your married house um that's it's just not appropriate otherwise and it is um young people who live on their own as single are seen as leaving the family behind and all this stuff so this i mean this was in the 80s so remember this was set in the 80s um is when she was working with these things so that's the context here just a disclaimer um but she's she has is talking about the specific um plight of being a woman in a very strongly no questions asked patriarchal uh hierarchy as in in her in in her culture in the in the hispanic culture um there are um cultures other cultures that are like that she she specifically mentions um asian cultures like you know chinese is the chinese culture is very similar where the the father figure of the family is the one there's no his rule is not questioned um so she's she just she compares hispanic um to in Ch chinese cultures uh, similarly um so that's another theme is not just growing up um, in general, but growing up specifically as a female in a patriarchal culture. Um, what goes along, but what interestingly goes along with being a female in this society is she, she talks quite a bit and explores quite a bit in this book some, yes, and in her poetry later on, the idea of feminine sexual development, female sexuality, this, um, 
ownership of one's body, right? She's very, that's something even later on, she's very much interested in and an advocate for is um, the feminine possession of her own body. Um, in this novel specifically, uh, Esperanza is um, trying to figure out what her body can do, what it's for, what sex will be like. Um, she feels like she's been lied to um, about what um, romance can be, what what a, a woman's sexual experience could be, because she has had pretty negative experiences where she had the the older man at her first job grab her and kiss her. She um, was assaulted by a group of white boys at a fair, fair circus kind of a place um, that is depicted in here. And that was a, a formative experience for her. She w sees some of her friends be married and, and trapped away at a pretty young age and spit out babies and then get left by their husbands. And so she has just a real bitter um, view of what her role as a sexual woman could be and what her potential as with her female sexuality could be. And so that's a, a theme she explores um, as part of growing up is figuring that out and learning about that for herself. Um, and so um, I would say all, all kind of along in the background of all of this growing up and the themes and the way she writes her books out. Maybe the last thing I would uh, talk about is the concept of home and what a home is, because I want to make sure I emphasize that because that is something that Cisneros has made the campaign of her life, right? Having a home, uh, a home of one's own, a home of her own. She is a, a modern day, um, minority Chicana reimagining of uh, Virginia Woolf. Virginia wrote, w Virginia Woolf famously wrote A Room of One's Own, which became sort of a feminist manifesto where um, Virginia Woolf basically said, um, she's a, a British uh, author, English, if, if you don't know who she is, um, but she essentially said, you know, um, if, a, if a woman was given a private place to herself to write. And if she was given an income, she said 500 pounds a year, which at the time would have been enough to live on. So, um, you know, Virginia Woolf's whole thing is essentially if a woman is given peace and quiet and a place that she feels belongs to her, and if she's given the income slash resources to survive, and she didn't have to work to the bone, imagine the art and poetry and thinking and discoveries that women could make. The only reason that women at her, you know, in her opinion, at, up into, you know, turn of the century, early uh, 20th century, the re only reason women had fallen behind and had not been on the same level as men in the past as far as literary achievement, scientific achievement, being recognized for, uh, for their minds is because we had domestic expectations. To, and so we were, we, we were expected to marry, spit out babies, take care of the home, clean, be in charge of the domestic sphere. You know, we talked about with little women. Like that was what was expected with for them. So Virginia Woolf's whole thing is, imagine if women did not have that same expectation, but they had a, a place, they, their physical needs were met. Imagine what they could crank out of their minds. And so Cisneros um, claims at the time when she was writing this, she claims and I, you know, I believe her, but her, her claim is she had not read Room of One's Own at the time. She was not, she was not intentionally rehashing Virginia Woolf. It was an instinctual feminine impulse, right? And so because it was an instinctual feminine impulse that, you know, Esperanza and Cisneros through her, she just wanted her own place. She fantasized about her own home that was quiet and and nice, like nice and clean and and safe and where she could, you know, write and do what she wanted to do because she had this impulse to, to crave that and yearn for that, it actually gives credibility to Virginia Woolf, you know, decades before, right, who was writing about the same thing as this um, almost bred in instinctual yearning that women have to like, 
you know, be have have their needs taken care of instead of being expected to take care of others' needs, and that they can um, produce uh, products of their mind if they're able to just be taken care of instead of being the take the caretakers, right? Um, so she's constantly fantasizing about a better house and a, a nicer house and a cleaner house, uh, Esperanza is, right? And um, that is something that um, Cisneros herself was trying to work through when she was writing this about, you know, she, Esperanza eventually realizes that a house is not the same thing as a home and tries to readjust her opinions about that and her expectations as far as that goes. But then that's something that Cisneros carries throughout her whole life is she is she devoted herself to living by herself having a dedicated off no matter how small of an apartment she ever lived in she always had a dedicated place to write um you know with good lighting a plant maybe you know that was warm and um you know that was that was conducive to her writing in san antonio she had um, a roof on her house that was a, like a uh with a great view that had a great place to write. So she has always dedicated herself to this, um, living on her own terms, having a space of her own that was home for her. It wasn't, she was expected to make a home for someone else. She made home for herself, right? So she, she's dedicated herself to this life of, um, having a, a home of one's own, right? Uh, you know, for a woman. Um, so, be looking for that as it, it goes through <laughs> underneath all of the um, little vignettes and the things that Esperanza talks about. All of this boils down to um, Esperanza trying to figure out her identity. And her her age plays a factor, her um, gender plays a factor, her um, socioeconomic class plays a factor, um, all of that geographic, you know, where she lives plays a factor, her role in the family uh, plays a factor. Um, that's something I didn't mention about Cisneros early in her bio is she was one of seven children, but she was the only girl. She had six brothers and she was the only girl. And so she felt even more isolated as a, as a female, as a Chicana, because her brothers, there were six of them and they all kind of paired off and had best, there was like two brothers were best friends, two brothers were best friends, you know, et cetera. And then she was on her own. And, um, and so she even felt, more isolated because of her her gender growing up that way so all of this all of these things that you know being chicana having um an ear for poetry having um being esperanza being a certain age you know growing up and um and living in a patriarchal uh, culture um, living in between the borderland of not this or this kind of in between all of that um, leads into her developing her identity um, as a young person and leading into a woman, into womanhood. So that's, if that's not coming of age, then I don't know what is, right? That's, these are, these are the, the things that coming of age deals with, coming of age novel, novels deal with. We saw it with Pip. We saw it with Joe. We saw it with Marguerite, my Angelou, right? Who am I, right? Who am I? Why am I here? Um, what's my identity? and various factors contribute to that. So, um, well, I think that's plenty. <laughs> I s talked longer than I thought I was going to about Sandra Cisneros and House on Mango Street, but there's, it's so deceptively simple. It's these tiny little stories written from a young girl's perspective. Um, so it seems like a simple little short, cool book, but there's so much going on. Um, there's so much depth in the, in the skill that Sister Rose puts in here. So I, I guess I had more to say about it than I thought I did. Um, but uh, in class and in your reading responses, we can talk more about specific passages from the text and questions you might have. And um, until then, watch that other video I'm gonna link. It'll give you more specifics about the plot and the characters and symbols and things. And then I will see you in class. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions, like usual, get in touch. But otherwise, have a great week and I will talk to you later. Bye.